Now, there's a couple of theories of what Tumbalum is. They know from recent archaeology it's ancient, ancient, ancient. Yeah, we're from about 6,000 years back, yeah. But the mound itself, no one's quite worked out what the mound is. They know it's not a Norman Mott and Bailey. They've recently done some archaeology and found out that it's much, it's, it's much too, well, the construction's all wrong for a, a Norman Mott and Bailey. I did get some names. And the I'll name, Barham, <laughs> yeah, Tumbalam relates to Barham. Well, if you, if you look at that name in so far as Latin and Welsh, yeah, you get back to uh, a Barham or a Barassus in Latin, yeah, and there was, there's a one line in the Roman Chronicles that Barassus upsurped Chilean and burned it to the ground. Yeah, now I often wonder whether the, the local Silus, yeah, buried him there to remind the Roman fortress and particularly the barracks, which is just behind you, Paul, yeah, that if you mess us around again, we'll burn down your town again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great thought, that sure. is. I mean, yeah. yeah. And then you researched it back to Welsh <coughs> or Pythonic British, yeah. ancient British. Yeah. They come up with this idea, well, it's somewhere in between Barassus and Barham. Right. And Barham is mentioned in the Roman Chronicles about burning down Caleon right. when the Romans yeah. got a bit above themselves. Yeah. And it's, and, it's, and it's so almost in the shadow of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's overlooking it's, the Roman yeah, yeah. fort. It's got a BDI on it, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, you've got like, because that, yeah, yes. is six kilometres away from that, which is Lodge Hill, which is an Iron Age fort, yeah, yeah. 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 which is six kilometres away from Tradiga Fort, the right. Gare. Yeah. Yeah? yeah, and the gear is six kilometres away from Tumbalum, so you've got this six kilometre triangle, yeah. like, you know, which no. is remarkable, isn't it? So they still believe it's Iron Age Fort? No, no they've so they, changed the yeah. news on that now. It was used in the Iron Age, it was used in the Bronze Age, but they're pretty sure it went back to the Meso right. okay. Mesolithic. Right. Wow. You're right back in the wow. Stone Age. So, the, like, the older things in Britain on the landscape are, are called henges. Yeah. 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 So, like, Stonehenge so yeah. is a henge someone put some stones on thousands of years later. Right. So henges are ancient, they, yeah. they're back in the Stone Age, yeah? yeah? yeah. And they, they, they worked out henges are basically meeting places, because all they've ever found there is evidence of feasting. Right. Yeah? So they were meeting places for the tribes, obviously. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that ringed ditch yeah. on the top of Tumbala, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? That's the henge. So right. that was an ancient meet, meeting place. And then later it was used by the Iron Age people, well, and the Bronze Age people, and then the Iron yeah. Age people, and then someone for a mound there. Yeah. It's a different, sort of different function later on then, is it? Yeah, well, uh, they call it um, continuity <coughs> of use. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's always used. Like my old house. But it, it changes with the people. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Because when we tell me that, I'm like, we also live. Yeah, yeah. Else. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It changes with the yeah. people. It's what they use it for. Yeah. It's like a, a farmer turning up and finding a Bronze Age burial mound on his land, you know, buys a farm and there's a cairn there and a pile of stone there and he thinks, oh, I could build an house out that. Yeah. <laughs> the other way. What language is that, Rich? Well, uh, uh, Bythonic British, uh, early Welsh, yeah. if you like. But it's, it's not Welsh, it's because there's no Wales at that time, it's yeah. British, you know. And um, they, they discovered that um, way back in the Bronze Age, they found um, three, four names that relate to them, to each other. They all mean silver. They all mean trading in silver. And there's, there's one on, uh, one in Ireland, and there's one in Scotland on the west coast. There's one in Wales, yeah? And there's one in Brittany, and there's one on, uh, in Portugal. And they're ports, they're ancient Bronze Age ports, and they all got the same name, silver in that Celtic language, wow. in that uh, British language. So that language was, was here in the Bronze Age, and it was on the west of Europe. So then it, it must have traveled the other way. Interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I get it all wrong every time. It's only now I'm putting the record button on. <laughs> <laughs>
What does Avalon mean? Um, What's, what interpretation do you The land of... Uh, what did I just say? Apples. Apples, Apple, apples yeah. Um, or Avalonius. Yeah. Who came over with Joseph of Arimathea. There's three theories, yeah. One is, is apples, yeah. That is the land of apples. And in fact, the lichen that grows on apple trees. That's the first theory. Right. Avalonius came over, the early Christians. Yeah. Avalonius was cited to travel with Bran the Blessed, who brought Christianity to the Isle of Britain according to the triads, mm -hmm. yeah? Or, or more simply, yeah? What's Avon in Welsh? River. Yeah? What's land? Church. Or a flat piece of ground. Or enclosure. Yeah? So Avalon could easily be Avon clan, couldn't it? Really close, isn't it? Yeah? What's this? This place? A huge enclosure. Where is it? Right on the river. Yeah. So this could be the enclosure on the river. This could be the Avalon everyone's talking about. And if you think about it, this was built, I, in my opinion, to control the trade coming up the river. Because the river comes up from the, the Severn, it hits this fort, yeah, and then it's a, a really sharp meander, right hand bend. And you'd have to mm -hmm. slow your ships down and you'd have to be really careful though you come round there otherwise you get stuck on the mud banks or you get stuck somewhere, yeah? And whoever slowed down by there would be subject to the policing of the people standing here. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get up to Cleon without passing this place and passing that bend. And it's a tidal river, so you'd even know what time yeah. of day the ships were coming up. <laughs> so I reckon this is this is Avalon. This is this is the, the enclosure on the river. And uh, all those all the romance that was built up around these things. It's all French, isn't it? It's the first French novels ever. You know, they built uh, this uh, this whole romance around Arthur and chivalry and all this. I mean Arthur in Welsh literature in the triads and all he's no he's no hero, he's he's a bit of an idiot. He's a great fighter. Like, like a lot of people you would know, like, you know, they might be big and strong and, and really good in a fight, but it don't mean they're particularly good with people, and it don't mean they're particularly diplomatic people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur was just the same, this is an illegitimate son of a, a, a local king, Sorry. like, you know, and he, and, and he just happened to be really good at fighting. So the, 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 the Cymru, the, the, the the British of this area, they they thought, right, we'll stick him in charge. You know, he'll 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 do the job. A good puppet. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. But then and then you get the French romance novels, and they built all this romance and chivalry, and yeah. Well, they are obviously these are tribal people. They had a code of honor, <coughs> like the North American Indian or any tribal race. There are these codes of honour, you know, you, there's certain things you would do and there's certain things you'd never do. And if you did do them, you were going to be put to death, you know? Like, you'd like never throw a Coke can in a river, would you? Because someone would come and lob your head off of a sword because you were dishonouring the goddess of the river. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would the river, do you know, do we know if the river was as accessible then as it is now? We don't know. We do know the Romans, 2,000 years ago, built a massive port right by the Hambry. It, so in that case, it would have been dredged, it would have had docks. Uh, there's, another, there's another dock here, um, uh, Pilchmauer, yeah? Pilchmauer, which is that bit of land by there, yeah? Which is where the two hills dip down and then you just got like this wet bit and, and then Malpas behind it and you. 
well, Pilch is, um, is dock or, 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 or wet area. Yeah, Mauer is um, big. big. Big in Common Welsh, but a uh, great, uh, royal. You know, it could be any of those things. Uh, you know, when you talk about ancient Welsh, there's usually three meanings to each word. Yeah. Mm. So now this is could this could be a royal dock, a great dock, a big dock. You know, but it's 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 a dock. And if you go down by low below Pulchmower Farm and get down on the river there, yeah, there's a walkway across there now. You can walk down there a little bit and you can turn back and look up the river and you'll see these massive blocks of stone just sitting in the river. Uh, Alan Ort and, and me went down there years ago and you can see that there's some kind of structure that's fallen to pieces there, you know. So it was probably a, a little dock on the bend of the river there yeah. as a police station and then the Romans probably just revamped a much larger dock because next to the amphitheatre, just below it, they'd done a dig well, about 10 years ago, didn't they? And uh, they found a, a huge dock and, and a, a, a great big courtyard. So it implies there was less yeah. sediment in it. It was a massive. So they were using they it then. It so I don't know whether they were taking sediment out or... And over the, and over the years, it's just been allowed to silt up, exactly, to silt up, yeah. to silt up. And I just seen, seen them. And, it, and it might be, it might be something to do with the change in the farming techniques further up the river. You, you know? can see, if we have enough time, Rich, like I said, there's that clearing that I can take you to on the, on the bank. Yeah. And you'll yeah. see what Rich is saying. You can't understate the power of, of you know, control, especially with the tidal ranges, yeah. that, that, that would have brought the defence, wouldn't it? Like you said, because it's such a, a okay. tight river to navigate. And, there's someone, and I reckon there's someone important buried there. Because yeah. there's a mountain yeah. there. and 300 BC this was built. They don't know exactly. They know it was between 600 BC and 300 BC. Yeah? That's the archaeology tells them that. Then they know um, when the Romans turned up they were slighting the ditches and the Romans the Romans done something to the, the ditches on the one side. They don't know whether they were uh, putting a road into them. It's probably, it's probably a road from the port linking up to the old road well, that was already they, there. Some places they well, stayed side by side, didn't they? And they, they kind of, they coexisted together. Oh, yeah. What, we, what, what you've got to also appreciate with the Silurians, right? The Romans turned up in Britain and uh, they had a massive army. They had like an army of, I don't know, 40,000 men, yeah? And the first thing they done was they went for the biggest and most powerful tribes. And one of the biggest and most powerful tribes were the Catavanias of, of, of um, uh, southeast yes, south England, yeah, north of London, isn't it? And they, they went for them and they, they, they had a battle with them, a huge battle, you know, a protracted war actually, with more than one battle. But the last battle was a huge battle where um, um, uh, Caradog and his brother met them on an open field and they fronted up to them, they fought them, and they lost. Gradog's brother was killed, yeah, the Romans won the day. Gradog grabbed the rest of his warriors that were left, and he legged it over to you. He came to the Cyrus, and the Cyrus adopted him, took him on, and made him their war leader, yeah? And then the Romans headed here, yeah? They headed here, they met them at the first battle, they met on the Y, the Cyrus beat the Romans, they annihilated the legion. So the Romans took a step back and they thought, hang on a minute, we say some good, we think, yeah, we we'll think this one. So then the Romans marched north, yeah, and the Cyrus marched north as well. Met up with the tribe up there, I think they're called the Dimitri, not 100% sure, and they had another battle up there. In that battle, um, the Romans, I don't know how they done this, but the Romans captured Craddock's father, his wife, and his children. They didn't win the battle, the Romans didn't win the battle, they lost a lot of men. And they, they had a, quite a, a, a horrific exchange between them. 
but somehow Caradoc's family was caught. So the war leader's family was caught. So the war leader then, right, he was up in northern England, he went to the Brigantians uh, to get more troops. Yeah, he was trying to create a confederacy of uh, tribes to fight the Romans, like, you know. So he went up there, and the queen of the Brigantians put him in chains and handed him over to the Romans. So that was the end of Cladog's uh, lead in the Silurians. And the Romans thought, oh, we've got a great prize here, we've got their king, that's going to be the end of the fighting, isn't it? Mm -mm. Well, that's not what happened. No. So um, they took Cradog off to Rome and uh, with his family and uh, they took him to the Senate. Uh, ritually, the Romans would uh, strangle ancient kings on the steps of the Senate in front of the crowds of the Romans, but that didn't happen to Cradog. And you remember, that people like Cradog, these are educated men. Right? They're, they're, not, they're not idiots, you know, they speak two, three languages. They're educated in mathematics, astronomy, you know, they're, they're highly educated mm. people. These are the nobles of, of the tribal system, mm. like, you know. Tribal system's the wrong word. They, these are kings yeah. of kingdoms, you know. And uh, so they, they, somehow, he manages to negotiate to be able to give a speech to Claudius, who's the, who's the uh, Roman Caesar of the time, of, and, and the Senate, which is the Roman government. Yeah. And he gives this speech, and uh, it's recorded. He says, I, I, there's no way I can do this word for word, but i give you a rough idea. He says something like, um, because you Romans want to rule the whole world, does that mean everybody else wants to be a slave? And you come to my country, and you, 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 you came, and I had horses, and I had men of arms, and I had uh, towns and villages, and everything that wealth provides, and you expect me to give it to you? And I, if I hadn't, if I had given it to you, then I wouldn't be famous, and your, your victory wouldn't be famous. But because I fought you, and you won, and I'm captured, your victory is famous, and my defeat is famous. And because of that speech, they said, oh, we won't kill you. <laughs> and we won't strangle your kids. And they give them a place to live. Uh, a small um, uh, island, uh, I think it's an island, off the coast of Italy. And uh, it was known as the, the, the island of the Christians. And they believe that um, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, because you're at the same period of time now, you know, you know you, this is just after the, the death of uh, Jesus and, and Paul's in, uh, in Rome, yeah? And they reckon Paul and the first Christians were held there as well when it turned up in Rome. And Cradog's father, who was with them, was called Bran. Yeah, this is Bran II, really, in, in Welsh, uh, British history. Bran was held there as well. And Bran in the triads is sided with bringing Christianity to Britain. Now they know that after that, those couple of battles, the Romans needed reinforcements in Britain. So they brought two other legions from Rome. And Caradoc came back with those legions. And he, was, he had to give a promise that he would never raise arms against the Romans again. Well, personally, he didn't. But the Silures carried on fighting. And Tassius, uh, who was a Roman uh, writer of the time, well, he was writing actually about 50 years after the, the, all this happened, but anyway, he recorded it. He said that after Caradog was caught, the Romans thought that would be the end of hostilities, and the hostilities intensified. And then uh, uh, there was an instant where a, a Roman legion got into uh, one part of Wales, we don't know where, but uh, into Silurian territory, and started building a fort, and they were surrounded and annihilated. And only a handful of them survived, and they only survived because another fort further away sent a rescue party. You know, and that was a big blow for the Romans. They were because they they were losing officers. They weren't just losing men; they were losing their top people. And then the the Roman governor of Britain at the time he died of exhaustion fighting the Silures. Yeah. And no one that was replaced, he got killed by the Silures, yeah. And this went on for 25 years, this war. 
and it's the Romans just trying to get into this part of Wales. Right? And then in the middle of that, um, the Romans decide, well, what we do is we'll go murder all their priests. So they march up to Anglesey and they kill all the Druids. Mm -hmm. Oh, all hell breaks loose then. Boudicca gathers up half a dozen tribes and goes marauding round South East England and burning cities. They nearly wipe out the whole Roman presence. And at the same time, yeah, a guy called Barassus or Barum, from Barum, yeah, burns down Caleon. And the mm. Romans are nearly extinguished out of Britain. And then, so they bring two more legions. Mm. Then uh, they bring their crack troops from Africa, from Palestine, and they bring another 20,000 soldiers over here. And uh, that's the, uh, those soldiers, one of them, one of the legions of them are the, the second Augustan uh, legion, and they're the ones who, who actually build Caleon. Eventually, the Second Augustan Legion, they're like the SAS of the Roman world. This yeah. is the hardest troops they've got. Yeah? And they're the ones that eventually built Leon. But we don't know. The Romans' writings about the end of the Silurian War, they say, they don't say they defeated the Silurians. They don't say it was a great victory. You know? What they say is the Silurians were subdued. Mm. Yeah. And then they get you, and then they build the side. There's a huge city just down the road, the Carwen. Massive place. And they call it the market town of the side. It's almost like they, they said, all right, boys, you won. <laughs> We're not going to get in here without your okay. Yeah. You let us in here to trade at Kalian, at that port. You let us build a port there and trade, and we'll build you a huge city to live in. You know? And, and, and the, this part of the world, Siluria, never becomes a civitas. Yeah, the Romans had two words. They had they had one word for civilized and one war word for warlike. You know, mm. and this area stays like that for hundreds of years. Eventually, the Silurian government take over in there. But as um, soon as they hear, mind they recruit recruiting locals. Because they're not Romans, you can't you can't maintain it with Roman soldiers. Because the Roman soldiers aren't Romans. Yeah. They're from Africa. They're from everywhere. Every time where the Romans went, they recruit men. You know? And they dug up one burial at the college over there. There was a, a Roman uh, military captain, yeah, which is pretty high up, like you know, he's he's gone up, yeah. And they done that testing on his teeth to find out where he was born and he was born between Caleon and Carwen. <laughs> he was born over St. Julian's Way. Right. Yeah? And he was, a, he'd, he'd, and this is like, this, the Romans had only been here 20 years, like, you know, and so he'd moved up in the ranks at that time and he's a local. Yeah? So you can see as soon as they got you, they're recruiting men. And that's why you ended up with this huge town, because you can imagine People, oh, there's jobs. The Romans are given jobs. All you have to do is march around. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do much because there's no war anymore. Nice you know? uniform. And it's a great job because you do 20 years in the Roman army and they retire you with a pension. Yeah. And they give you a piece of land to live on. They give you a house. So, more houses. Yeah. All the Roman soldiers retire. Yes. And they're not Romans, they're locals. You know, so the, the area is, isn't really a Roman province at all. It's Romano-British. It's living in a Roman style. Sign me up, man. Sign me up, yeah. 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 An outer gate, more ditch, and the main gate. And it's strange to think that you walk in in footsteps of where the real King Arthur II will have walked, because he will have come in and out of this gate who knows how many times. More ditches. inside the fort.
keep saying about like the Arthur question. Oh well, there's a couple of Arthurs in history. He could have been anywhere. Yeah, well, of course, there's a couple of Arthurs. How many Edwards is there in the royalty of the English? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many Jameses are there? Is there how many Henrys are there? Well, there's eight Henrys, aren't there? You know, of course, you name if, you, if someone's famous, you know, and, and you, yeah, we do it now, don't we? We name them after film stars these days. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like, they, 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 uh, they, they, I don't know they, we're, what it is with historians and archaeologists, they won't apply any bloody common sense to things. No. Everything has to be, like, so complex, and, and, they're, yeah, and then they're just talking about people. And the, same, yeah, same with archaeology, you know, I mean, I watched that, um, oh, what is it, where they do the digging? Time, time, digging. Time, time, yeah. Watch, I used to watch that and love it, but I... I on, surely you know you're putting something very romantic about it, but surely there's a practical reason for this, and you're not seeing it, you know. I, um, I watched it often. I went watched yeah. the Time Team dig, right? Uh, on, it's on YouTube now. You can get it, right? On the Island Mull in Scotland, right? I've been to the Island Mull in Scotland. It's on the west coast of Scotland, right? and they they dug up a, 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 a monastic settlement, a, a monastery, yeah. Uh, right up on the hill about Tobermory. And it's a, it's a lovely place, there's, there's standing stones going down the hill, right where it was, you know. There's another thing, there's continuity in it. Yeah. Religious, the standing stones are a religious place or a significant place, and then they build a monastery next to it. You know? Anyway, um, they found the saint shrine, or what they call the house of the saint, right, which was like a pile of stones like that, and the bones of the saint are in there. Right? You know? And uh, the whole monastery is built around them, right. And the whole thing was packed with these little bits of quartz. Loads and loads and loads of them, right? And I, I thought, that was fantastic, isn't it? Now, they found that more than once. Yeah? So they know that this stone, this quartz stone, is revered by the early Christians and they're putting it in St. Shrine. They know that. They know that the earliest Christian graves that they built, dug up in, in Wales, over at... Um, uh, by Cardiff, I think of the name in it, Clandoch, yeah, Clandoch, every Christian grave, they had no grave goods in there at all, it was obviously a very poor community, yeah, they had nothing put in their graves, but every one of them had a piece of this, yeah. uh, one little stone, yeah, so they, they know all this, don't they, and then they know, and what's that, the lead archaeologist, the one with a long, Great. Yeah. Nick, was it yeah. Nick Ashley or Ashton, I, I don't know. Yeah, he, he, he was he was a, a, a well respected professor in his field, yeah. And uh, he said why they were digging these up and they were finding them. He said, oh yeah, he said there's a there's a fair bit of evidence in Ireland that um, the first churches, their foundations were made out of this stone. Yeah, they are all this. Yeah, you try and convince a historian yeah, that this has any religious significance in Britain and they'll totally deny it. And yet it's found everywhere in all these uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got a theory, right? There's a, you know, I was saying to you earlier the story in the Mabinogi uh, where Arthur where it says, it says Arthur held, held court in Killian on us at Whitson because it was the most accessible place in all of his lands by, by land and sea, or it was the easiest place to get to. Yeah? And why he was holding uh, court, the 13 churches of Chilean all had choirs singing. Now those choirs, in that time, this Gregorian chant stuff, right, sung 24 hours of the day. Yeah? So he's got 13 churches singing 24 hours a day. And then it says, in Kalean. Now, Kalean is, you can't have 13 churches here, can you? That's just silly. Yeah. Now, you couldn't put 13 churches for there. So I figured, you, they're talking about the Lordship of Kalean. And a medieval town is, is, is about, uh, I think it's about three, four miles square. You know, and then you have the boundaries of the town, uh, the most important buildings that are on the edge of the town, 
Yeah, and then the, the interior of the town is generally farmland. So it, it works like sort of the surround is more important than the centre. Village green stuff, like you know. Anyway, um, so I figure, right, these 13 churches have got to be around here somewhere, haven't they? Yeah? Now we got this huge outcrop of conglomerate quartz on the mountain there, right? And I've noticed in Cumbran, uh, in eight locations, where there are churches, or have been churches, yeah, there's big piles of this conglomerate quartz. I know the, 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 the geologist told me that, um, that the glaciers didn't actually get down this far. They, they hit the, the, the valleys above us to the north and they got stuck in those hills and they melted and then sea wash came down over the earth, massive tidal washes came down and washed soil and hills across the Severn and created the Mendips. Yeah? So you had this massive wash. Now all this time you've got this huge lump of conglomerate quartz sticking out of the ground. Yeah? So this gets ripped off, lumps of that get ripped up and they get washed down the hill. But then you are talking about stones now that weigh like several ton. So they're not going to get washed across the Severn. They're just going to get washed down the side of the eastern escarpments of none of me. Yeah? And they're going to come, they're going to come down, down, well this, the wash is coming over the mountain and it's generally headed south, yeah, so they're going to go down that direction. So when I find a big pile of conglomerate quartz, and it's in the opposite direction to the wash and the opposite direction of the outcrop, yeah, you can be pretty sure that some men took it there. Because they couldn't get there any other way. And they don't roll there when they weigh four tons, do they? You know? So I found spots in Cumbran where these big piles of conglomerate are there, you know? And then if you look on the old maps, you go, ah, oh, there was a chapel there. Or oh, there, you know. And these churches, the churches don't go away. Like if you build a church 2,000 years ago, there's still a church there today. And if it's not a church there, there's a, there's a place named, say, in Church Woods, or, you know. Yeah? And particularly in, in, in Wales, because of the place names. But, um, so I reckon these 13 churches, I think eight of them were in Cumbran which is the Lordship of Cleon. It's always Cleon, you know. Van Derbel was in Cleon, you know. Lantana Madi was Cleon Abbey. Yeah, so from the river up to the mountain is Cleon. A crossover to Alterine or the Gare, that's Cleon. And then if you go that way, I think you get over to about Clan Henoch. Yeah, and you're in, you're in Cleon. Yeah. I think we could actually pinpoint each one of these 13 churches and prove they existed. Take a bit of money, mind, and an awful lot of work. But, but uh, those legends, the Mabinogai, and no one's lying. I don't know why people think like uh, some guy, you know, a thousand years ago, but oh, I know a good story, I'll make up this story and tell everyone it's true. It's just nonsense, isn't it? They're, they're obviously true. Why would you keep a story that was alive? Why would you carry it on? It's like that book, um, Rossa. Uh, uh, I gave him a copy as well. The story of Gwent. It's from 1900. It was before Cleon College was built. Yeah? It was a school book, um, reference book for the history of Gwent. Okay. It's called The Story of Gwent. It had a stamp in it that said St. Giles Boys School, which is in the old Cumbran, in Cumbran. Yeah? They knocked it down now, but it was there. And uh, it starts off, right, the story of Ben, and it talks about Craddock and the Romans, and how he beat them in these battles, and his speech in Rome, and all this. Yeah? All this is just accepted this week. Get into the Arthur thing, Arthur's in Cleon, and all this, and these ten battles he fought against the Saxons, and all this. So, all normal history. And then geology of the place, and then you know, and and that was just like that, that was the accepted history. Yeah? Thirty years later, all that's disputed. That's all nonsense. It's mad, isn't it? How does that make any sense? Great day out, huh?
Lovely. Oh, I really enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> Ben yeah, is the one I'm talking about. Right. So yeah. as you come, as you walk down, so you come straight up, yeah, yeah, yeah under those bridges, and then you got this sharp right bend to come round here. And, you and then you got all this, but this this could have moved some of it, you know. But that seems very significant to me now. And, yeah, and you can go down to there. Well, we're in terms of time constraints. Yeah. I mean, I mean, mean, can we get to the edge of the field? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can walk down that way. Yeah. Let's walk to the edge yeah, of the field. Yeah, you get the sense it's been sort of contained. Every time I come up here, I can just. Okay. there you can see right across there but not more importantly you can also see through you can see through the gap in the trees there but very visibly there you can also see Tumbalan yeah which obviously would have been which is significant sig significant well, yeah you'd have to um see this fort would have to talk to them yeah 100 yeah? percent yeah and and um the gear which is the other side of hang on the gear is but there just, just those clump of trees there behind That's the it. clock tower, isn't it? That's it, yeah. That's the gear. So that one has to talk to this one, and they both have to talk to that one, and that one can talk to the whole interior of Siluria. Yeah. They can talk to people in Brecon, they can talk to people up in Abergavenny, they can talk to people in Cardiff. That's the bend by the side of the road by that. Ah. And that's the mound over the side. Oh. Right, okay, that's the, like the tall booth. So yeah, so it's a yeah. very unnatural looking mound. It is really, The way it? the land goes yeah, down, yeah. Like, and then it goes back up in the end there. Uh, and that's Pilf Mauer Farm. Depending on your time, Paul, I can take you down to there later if you want to mm. look. Probably not today. Not today. That's Sunday that's dinner day today, isn't it? Oh, of course it is, yeah. Sunday dinner day for no, this bit, yeah. no, I think But as, is, as you sit on that grassy cool. mound there, you can you can see yeah, the bend and the meander in right. the river where Richard's saying but, um, obviously yeah. would have had significant but I, control, I but also very clearly you can see Tumbalan, which is just through the hills there. Can you see the pit? Oh, yeah, got it, yeah. That's Tumbalan. Yeah. 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 Far end of the fort, if you like. Yeah. Now there's a, a river bend there, very sharp river bend, yeah. And there's nothing that's coming up from the seven that doesn't go round that bend. And then just to the right of the bend, can you see the green mound? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's really interesting. I never could figure out why there's a mound there because the natural lie of the land goes down and you think it just sloped down to the bottom there. But it doesn't. For some reason it goes back up and you've got this big mound there. It doesn't look very much from here, but if you get down below it and look up to it, 
It's pretty big and if you consider there's probably a, a few thousand years of wear and tear on the top of that mound, I personally believe there's someone significant buried there protecting the town of Cleon or protecting this part of Siluria. Yeah? They, they, they would have, um, we know from the, the stories of the Mabinogai and other legends that they had the idea that the, the Silures and the, a lot of the early Iron Age British tribes had the idea that the soul or the spirit resided in the head. Yeah? And they believed that if um, a great warrior had died, they would take his head, his skull, and they'd place it somewhere significant and they believed his spirit or his soul would protect them. Yeah, and so you see, um, if you see reconstructions of Iron Age villages, there's often skulls in the gateway. And those skulls are the old warriors protecting the village, you know? And uh, the story of uh, 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 Bran, the son of Clear, um, they, he gets assassinated in Ireland and they, he tells his warriors to cut his head off cut his head off and he'll guide them home and he talks to them all the way home you know until they get back you know? and so that that idea that cult that came right up into the uh, into the early Christian the idea of a, a, a spirit a, a, a guardian spirit and it's still here today isn't it? it's still here today so we got the the main port of the Silos, yeah? Forget everything else, Roman, because we got to go back with this place. we got to go back to the Bronze Age. We've got to go back to uh, at least um, three and a half thousand years ago. So let's say one and a half thousand BC, yeah? One and a half thousand years before the Romans even get to Britain. Or you could say a thousand years before Rome existed. Yeah, there was some kind of settlement here and there were people trading here. And they, they know that because when they done archaeology here, they found a, a Bronze Age a flint here that had been worked right up on the top of the hill. We also know that just through those trees there, you can see Tumbalam. Yeah? Oh, sorry. You just see Tumbalam. And Tumbalam, they so far, they found over 300 lithics. Uh, a lithic is a piece of flint that's been worked to make a tool, yeah? They found over 300 around Tumbalam. So that's a major Bronze Age settlement. And then we know there's Bronze Age burial mounds littered all the way across that mountain, all the way across Manath Main and down on the, on the, on the eastern escarpments of Manath Main. There's a term that a, a nun from Lantana Mavi come up there. It's beautiful, isn't it? The yeah. eastern escarpments of Mount Main, of the mountain of stone, yeah? There's Bronze Age settlements. We also know down in Lantanum, just behind us, just where um, Killian Abbey was, which is now known as Lantanum Abbey, but that didn't change until 1400. That is, there was Bronze Age settlements there, and there's been Bronze Age finds found there, yeah? And there's been Bronze Age found, finds found around, all the way around Kalia. So this is Bronze Age first, yeah? So we're in the period where they haven't even, they're not using iron. They're still using copper and bronze to make their axes, and, and they're using flint as their knives. And th those flint knives, they bled into the Iron Age, right up to sort of 800, uh, uh, BC, when you're getting into the, the period where they start in smelting iron, they're still using the flint knives because yeah. the flint knives are better than anything you can make out of iron. They're sharper, yeah, and they're more portable, yeah. But they, they flint doesn't come from here. You can't get flint here. You have to go. You have to go into the Cotswolds to get flint. You know. So the flint that's here, all that flint, is all traded, traded. with the yeah. people in the Cotswolds. Right. So if people get a, a weird idea about the Iron Age people and the Bronze Age people, they seem to think that these, these, they, they take the, 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 the propaganda that uh, uh, Julius Caesar come up with, that they were running around in half naked with animal skins wrapped around them, eating raw meat. That's what he said about the British. <laughs> Which is absolute nonsense because like, 
Um, at the time, of, the same time he's saying that, he also says a little bit later on in his in his writings that um, all the noblemen of Gaul, of France, sent their children to be educated in the monastic colleges of Britain. And, and Julius Caesar's main advisor while he was on his Gaul campaign was a Druid, a British Druid. You know, and that's well stated in history. And, uh, and they, he's, it's well stated that this is where they were taking, uh, sending the princes and the princesses to be educated. Mm. You know, places like um, uh, Lantwit Major, where there's an ancient monastic college that went right up into the Christian. Mm. But you can't, you can't divorce one time from another. So like, it doesn't sort of, they get to 800 BC and they go, right, that's the end of the Bronze Age. We're now in the Iron Age. Mm. And they don't work like that, does it? So one bleeds into the other. And it's the same when you get to the end of the Iron Age, you get up to about the, the birth of Christ, about, uh, what's that, 30, uh, 2000, yeah? And then all of a sudden, you're in the medieval. Well, that don't happen, does it? So one bleeds into another. And what, what, I, what I've discovered with research, right, is a, a very good example of it. See this um, quartz stone? And this quartz stone comes from uh, Manath Mine, uh, just up above Fawn Hill. There's an outcrop of conglomerate quartz. It's uh, 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 an ancient seabed that's 350 million years old that was formed on the, the coast of Africa uh, before the Teutonic plates moved around and pushed it up over here. And it sticks out of the ground over there at a 30 degree angle, is it? Uh, that some kind of angle is 10 foot wide, was right into the mountain. The, the miners used to call it end of shift. Because you hit it, that was the end of the shift. <laughs> you went home. <laughs> Why they blew it up to get through it. Anyway, this quartz stone, right, is the stone, the, this conglomerate quartz, and it was, it's, a, it's an ancient seabed, so it's like a sand and shell matrix with these lumps of quartz, which are 500 million year old metamorphosized metal from volcanoes that was shot out, like, you know, uh, bedded into it. So you get like this pudding stone stuff, don't you? And uh, this, this, uh, this quartz stones was revered in the Bronze Age. So you're, we're, we're back to three and a half thousand years ago, right? And they're putting standing stones up everywhere. They're putting these lumps of stones. And they're, and they're making lying down stones as well, particularly in Gwent, they like lying down stones. So, like, over there in Wentwood, yeah, they're dragging stones from Cumbran over to Wentwood to erect standing stones. And they're doing that because it's this stuff. And they're dragging them from other parts and taking them to Trelec and making the Harold stones. There's three great big stones there. They're conglomerate quartz as well. So everywhere in this area, they're using this conglomerate quartz for their standing stones. Now, they're selecting that. <coughs> they're selecting it for a reason, isn't it? Because they want to use that stone. Well, the fact that they want to use that stone means that stone means something to them. It's significant, isn't it? So I would suggest that it's a, an object that they revered or it had some kind of religious significance to them. And the reason I suggest that is because once you get up into the Christian period, which is, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump now, one and a half thousand years, yeah? into the Christian period, uh, 50, 59, 59 AD, Bran the Blessed brings Christianity to South Wales, you know, oh, is that 25 years after Jesus gets nailed to a piece of wood? Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and Christianity's year, yeah? And um, the, the early Christians, they're taking little lumps of this stone and they're taking it to St. Shrines as an offering, an oblation they call it. Uh, they're not putting money in there, they're from a, a quartz stone, you know, and they're saying, look, this, this, is, sac this is a sacred offering to the, the, the spirit of the saint or the soul of the saint. And they put it there and they say to the soul of the saint, right, I need a favor, my cow's sick or the mother-in-law's got a bad leg and, and she can't do any work in the field, you know, I'll give you this, you fix her leg. And so, like, we know 
that it's a religious object in the early Christian, so then it must be a religious object in the Bronze Age. And then if you go in, if you go into um, the Fulham, into this nice man's shop, or the, this nice couple's shop, Spirit of Arwen, you yeah, know. Yeah, Spirit of Arwen, yeah. <laughs> you will find these crystals from all over the world. And, and, and people go in there and they, they go, whoa, look at that, and they revere it and they buy it and they take it away and they stick it on their altar or in their bedroom or whatever, whatever's sacred to them. So it's still going on, it's still going on. So these beliefs and these people, nothing changes. All this happens, you know, but they're the same. They're the same people with the same belief systems and very little changes. Rich, did you say to me once as well that with Chumbalam along that ridge line, making its way over to Cumbran, that was a bit of a pilgrimage route because there was that church that you took me Yeah, to. right. Oh, I, we'll go back to the Christian. Because, uh, sorry about this, but we're going to jump back and forth. It's all right. Yeah. It's like, um, time, time is eternal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Human spirits live forever. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, There are oblations they use in quartz stones, right? So um, let's go back to uh, uh, the Black Book of Carnarvon, 1345, I think, the Black Book of Carnarvon. There's a poem in there called The Seven Survivors of the Battle of Camlan. Yeah? Camlan is the last battle of King Arthur. Yeah? And these seven warriors are the only survivors. The Camlan battle was apparently some huge civil war amongst the British. It was Arthur in the south and uh, uh, I think Mordred or Murrog or whatever you want to call him from up, uh, up in northern Britain, southern Scotland. He brought an army down here and they were going to kick Arthur out. Like, you know, they decided they had enough of this uh, guy. He's a bit too famous. And there was some family stuff going on as well. It was his nephew that was estranged and, you know, you know how families are like. Anyway, these two huge armies meet in uh, Baden, or oh, we don't know where that is, Mount Baden, the River Baden, probably somewhere up towards Brecon, yeah? and they have this huge battle, and uh, it's a horrific, bloody civil war, and almost everyone dies, yeah? almost everyone is killed, because it just goes on and on and on, and they end up with half a dozen men stand standing, or probably, let's say, half a dozen lords standing with a few of their foot soldiers, yeah? So these are the seven survivors of the Battle of Camelot. Arthur's injured, yeah, and gets carried off the battlefield, you know, and dies from his wounds, if you want to believe one story, or is healed from his wounds by some um, uh, female healers, and, and recovers and goes off to Brittany and lives there happily ever after. Choose your story, like, you know? But anyway, these seven survive. So, one of the survivors is a character called Devel Gardan, or Devel the Valiant. And we know Devel is the son, or the grandson, of the Emperor of Britain. I uh, can't quite remember his name. Something Mauer, that's great, you know. But um, anyway, he comes over to Britain to help Arthur fight the Saxons. Yeah? He wants to join up. It's just a young man going on the jolly leg, you know. But anyway, he's one of the seven survivors. And these seven survivors, they become, like, famous in Britain. So you have, and the poem's lovely, because the poem says things like, uh, Sandre survived because he was so beautiful. Everyone thought he was an angel, so nobody laid a hand on him in the battle. And then someone else survives because he was so ugly. He had the hair of a goat growing on his face that everyone thought he was a demon, so no one wanted to fight him. <laughs> Durval survived through the strength of his spear. Yeah? And then after the Battle of Camlan, Durval retires and he goes into the church. He sort of thinks, oh, I've had enough of warfare. And he goes into the church and uh, he builds two churches in Wales. One here, just over there. Uh, Literally, literally about three miles away. Mm. Yeah, six kilometers maybe. Across there on the side of the hill, there's a farm called Clan Derville. Yeah, and in uh, just above the farm, just above Green Meadow, 
just above where you live, yeah, just above the uh, uh, Masaru, uh, where the farmland starts. There's a little farmhouse, 500 year old building, and in the field above it, there's a ruined chapel, and that's the, the, the Cistercian chapel of Clan Derbal. And they turned that into a pilgrim shrine. It was probably a pilgrim shrine before the Cistercians turned up. The Cistercians didn't turn up until 1179. Well, you'd had Christianity in the area for nearly a thousand years by then, right. you know. But that Christianity, that's the new Druids, that's, um, that's an ancient uh, British form of Christianity that had very little to do with Catholicism that came later. And, uh, but the, the Catholic monks of uh, the Cistercians of, of Lantanum, which was Killian Abbey yeah, at that time, um, exploited it and they had we estimated from the oblations and the money they had to pay in taxes to King Henry VIII that there were about 6,000 pilgrims going up there on the first couple of days of April, which was the start of the pilgrim uh, season, you know? So they got Derval in there first, like, you know? But then he, 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 it's a spring worship time in April. So like, and Derval had a reputation for being this warrior saint that could go into purgatory and pull your relatives out of purgatory. Every time, every time, he, yeah, every time you cut a hazel, it releases, it releases um, youth hormones. It gets younger. Every time you cut a hazel, it gets younger, which is mad, isn't it? Right. It goes yeah. on for centuries, like, you know. Um, I was just saying to uh, it is, right? Mike, now this is probably one of the bottom ditches of the fort. It's, it's got three ditches going up the side of it all the way round. And the ditches that are... Um, I was reading in the archaeology report. I, I got an archaeology report from the University of Killian, or Wales or whatever. Uh, Ray Howell done a dig here in 2000. And um, they, the ditches were seven foot deep and they were 15 foot wide. So you have a, a bank, with a fence, yeah, then a, a seven foot ditch, yeah, that was 15 <laughs> foot wide, and then another bank, and another fence, and then a ditch, which was like seven foot deep, 15 foot wide, another fence, yeah, mm. then another ditch, and another bank, and another fence. Sure. So you'd have like Three rows of fencing through those ditches. If you wanted to get in here by force, It'd slow you down. You'd have it? no chance. Mm. But that's why everyone's always thought of them as forts, you know, for for defensive reasons. But it, that's not necessarily true. And most of the modern thinking now is saying that they they got more functions than just being a defensive fort, like you know. But if you think about those ditches, right? It also gives you walkways. It gives you walkways around it, yeah? Now all the, all the entrance was on one side, so you had one main entrance, yeah? So if you were like over that end of the fort, yeah? If you wanted to get to the entrance, you'd have to walk right through the middle, or maybe you could come round mm. the edges. Yeah. Yeah, like a ring road round the, yeah. round the town, you know? But uh, we never know, we're never going to know these things. All we're ever going to do is uh, look at what's left and, and, and surmise, and that. Mm. Yeah, so, um, we move on. Now that's what you call steep, isn't it? Yep, that's the shore. So where exactly have you got your shop then? In the Furham, in Kalian. In the Furham, right in the town centre. Indeed. And what do you sell? Right. Incense, jewellery, crystals, green man plaques. Green women plaques, clothes, um, clothes. Yes, that yeah. sort of thing. Yes, we've got crystals. Yeah, marvelous.